The Marian teachings of the Second Vatican Council constituted one of the greatest, if not the most complete treatment of Our Lady in any ecumenical council since the origins of the Church. Beautiful, true, aesthetically pleasing. This description of Our Lady is really exceptional and it's time that we untap the riches of the Second Vatican Council and see exactly where the Council points to in terms of authentic Marian doctrinal development. Hello and welcome to MaryCast. This is Dr. Mark Miravalli, Professor of Theology and Mariology at the Franciscan University of Steubenville. We're going to start a little mini-series on the Blessed Virgin Mary and the Second Vatican Council. And in this initial segment, I want to give an introduction to the overall approach of Mariology as we're going to see people entering into the Second Vatican Council and also where it goes once the Council begins. And let's begin with what we know with absolute certainty. The Holy Spirit protects and defends every ecumenical council. We can rest assured that everything that comes forward from an ecumenical council is true. It is protected from error by the Holy Spirit. Now, as conciliar theologians will tell you, as, as well as uh, even uh, papal statements will confirm, with an ecumenical council, God works with what people bring into the council. So, the more goodness and truth and beauty that's brought into the council, the more the Holy Spirit can sanctify and confirm. It's also the case that the Holy Spirit protects every council from error. So, we're going to see these factors relaying uh, to the issue of Our Lady in the Second Vatican Council. And later on in our series, we're going to talk about the three major controversies that happened at the Second Vatican Council regarding the Blessed Virgin Mary. You may know that most of the votes that took place at the Second Vatican Council were approved, that means documents being approved by the Council Fathers by well over 90-95%, a great number nearly unanimous with, with only a few nays to the yeas. The, one of the major uh, issues at the Second Vatican Council was whether Mary should be treated in a separate document or whether she should be included in the document on the church. Do you know, my friends, that it was the greatest single controversy at the Council in terms of voting. Uh, the ultimate decision to have Mary in the church, in the document on the church, uh, won by only 17 votes. So it was 49-51% in terms of the, uh, the, the vote of the fathers. So this tells us a little bit of um, why it is important for us to study the issue of Mariology at the Second Vatican Council. And I want to take us through step by step what is said about Our Lady. We're going to go paragraph by paragraph in examining exactly what did the fathers tell us, what did the fathers condition, where they actually said, we do not intend to give a complete doctrine on Mary. Those are the words of the fathers themselves. Where are we supposed to go forward in terms of what the Council has given us? And also, very critically, what is the issue of Marian mediation at the Second Vatican Council? So, we're going to talk about Our Lady and Vatican II. And I want to give you a foundation in this segment of some of the ideas of the Fathers entering into the Second Vatican Council and what happened with those as well. Well, there's two categories of Mariology that we have to identify and define right from the beginning. Number one is what is called Christological Mariology. Christological Mariology, also known as Classical Mariology, is a Mariology which asks the question, first, what is the relationship of Mary to Jesus? Sometimes you'll see this uh, posed as Christotypical Mariology. It's all the same thing. It's asking the question, what is Mary's relationship with Jesus? And therefore, Christotypical examination of Marian truth and love. Now, this is not just an ivory tower distinction. This is extremely important as to how you study the truth about the Blessed Mother. Christotypical or Christological Mariology says, you always start with Mary's relation to Jesus. And that, my friends, is going to talk about unique elements of the Blessed Mother that are not going to be true about the rest of us as members of the body of Christ. For example, uh, most of us, even on a high affirmation, good hair day, feeling great about ourselves, don't look at the mirror and say, oh, I think I'm immaculately conceived. Or, oh, I am full of grace. Or, oh, I am the mother of God. I gave flesh to the word. Or, oh, I am queen of heaven and earth. 
or I uniquely shared in the redemption, the mission of salvation with Jesus Christ as a co-redemptrix. So Mary has elements that are unique to her in a relationship with Jesus Christ. And that becomes the foundation of authentic classical or Christological Mariology. What is unique about Our Lady? What are elements about Mary uh, in relationship to Jesus that are exclusive to Mary? So, although Mary is a member of the church, she's also mother of the church. And first and foremost, if Mary doesn't say yes, we don't get Jesus and we don't get church. I'd mentioned earlier in one of our other segments the uh, interesting uh, exchange between Mother Teresa and a Protestant Christian who was sitting next to her on a plane. And she said, Mother, I, I, I admire your work so much, all the things you do for the poor and beautiful, but I've got a problem. Uh, it's your love of Mary, it's your attention to Mary. And Mother Teresa looked at the woman and said, it's very simple, no Mary, no Jesus. And my friends, that's so true, no Mary, no Jesus. And we can even say, no Mary, no church. Because if we don't get Jesus, who's head of the body, we certainly don't get the church, which is the body of Jesus, the body of his mystical person. So Christological Mariology does and must start with the issue what is Mary's relationship to Jesus and how is it unique? Second general branch of Mariology is called ecclesiological or ecclesiotypical Mariology. Ecclesia means church. So ecclesial, ecclesiological, ecclesiotypical Mariology says and, de and is defined as what is Mary's relationship to the church? And as we're going to see, ecclesiotypical Mariology is very rich. It's talking about Mary's relation to the church and the church's relationship to Mary. And the Second Vatican Council will do a beautiful treatment on Mary as perfect example, that the Blessed Mother is so much the perfection of human creation that she will always be our perfect example, our perfect model. We always are called to imitate her virtues. Now, once again, Christotypical Mariology, Mary to Jesus, Ecclesiotypical Mariology, Mary in relation to the church. In general, and these are broad stroke statements, but they're still very important. In general, both are extremely fruitful, but you must always, always, always begin with Christotypical Mariology. You must always ask the question, what's Our Lady's unique graces as the Immaculate Conception, as the Mother of God, as the Perpetual Virgin, as the woman assumed into heaven, body and soul, as the Queen of Heaven and Earth, as the Co-Redemptrix, Mediatrix of All Graces and Advocate? None of us can say that we are that in the way Mary can say that she was and continues to be that and all those things. So once we establish the truth about Mary in relation to Jesus, her uniqueness, then, and my friends, only then can we make a proper application and ask what is Mary's relationship to the church? How are we called to imitate Mary? In what ways is Mary unique with Jesus, but we are also called to share in what Mary does. Uh, one author put it this way, and it's, I think it's a very good outline. What is true about Jesus Christ in a first sense is true about Mary in a second sense. In other words, Mary participates in Jesus as the one mediator, as the one redeemer. Mary participates in the Holy Spirit as the advocate, but never on the level of equality with Jesus Christ. That would be heresy and blasphemy. So, Mary participates in what is true of Jesus like no other. We then, on a third level, the church, the people of God, the mystical body, we participate in the life of Jesus on a tertiary, or on a third level. For example, we are called to be co-redeemers in Christ. Many times in our series, we've talked about this mandate of St. Paul in 1 Corinthians 3 and 9. We're called to be co-workers with God. And John Paul II's mandate to you and to me, we're called to be co-redeemers, but we are not going to be co-redeemers like Jesus, the one redeemer, number one, and secondly, like Mary, the co-redemptrix, number two. So what is true of Jesus in a first sense is true of Mary in terms of participation, and is true of the church on a third level. That's why authentic ecclesiotypical Mariology can be very, very rich for the church, for us to know who we are. We're called as St. Maximilian Kolbe says, we're called to be mediators of grace one to another in the sense of our intercession. But none of us have a jurisdiction over grace and are able to give grace as Our Lady. So this is just an introduction. Stay with me as we go through this series on Our Lady and Vatican II. 
We're going to see history in the making, and we're going to see visions and, and true realities of who the Blessed Mother is for us today. This is Dr. Mark Mervali saying thank you, and God bless you.